this evening we will speak of the center, the climax of the Orthodox Church year, which is the observance of Holy Week and Pascha. Those days for which the Lenten observance prepare us, the only purpose of Lent uh, is that we might be prepared to be immersed into the passion, death, burial, and rising of the Lord. In order that we might do that, we have the time of Lent to be freed from the tyranny of the earthly cares, to discover more deeply than we usually are able the extent of our sinfulness, our need for forgiveness and healing, our total dependence on the mercy of God, so that when we reach those days of Holy Week and Pascha, we are able, not simply as outsiders, to remember the passion and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord, but to participate in that saving Pascha, that saving Passover. That is why on the level of the year, on the annual level, the Paschal observance are, constitute the greatest days of the year. There is no doubt about that for the Orthodox. Uh, sometimes if the question were to be asked, outside of the Orthodox experience, what is the greatest day of the year, even to Christians, uh, sometimes the answer would be given uh, that it's Christmas. But for uh, the Orthodox Christians, following the practice of the early church and realizing that everything that we know and experience and believe about Christ proceeds from his saving death and resurrection, there would be no question. Uh, that the answer would be that the celebration of Pascha is the center and the most important observance of the Christian year. Orthodox Christians, for uh, the Paschal observance, have always tried to make themselves as free as possible from the affairs of the world in order to participate fully in, in the great wealth and effort of liturgical worship during those days. It is within the context of those liturgical services that the experience of the church occurs, that this encounter personal encounter of each member of the church and the corporate encounter of the church together. It's within the framework, of course, of, of the common worship that this immersion into the saving Pascha of Christ occurs. So I want to, this evening, uh, summarize briefly, go through uh, the days of Holy Week day by day as they are observed uh, in the church so that when the time comes for you to experience them, many of you for the first time, uh, you can have this introduction to, to prepare for this most, most central of, of the church's observances. Holy Week begins in the Orthodox Church with the Saturday before Palm Sunday. Uh, nine days before uh, Pascha itself, with the Saturday that is called Lazarus Saturday. As we mentioned at the end of last week's talks, Lent ends, the 40 days of Lent, the 40 days of fasting, repentance for sin, ends with the Friday before Palm Sunday, and then on the two days following, Lazarus Saturday and Palm Sunday, the Sunday before Pascha, we have an anticipation of the triumph, of the victory of Christ over death. It's, it's not as if we enter into the Holy Week as if we're going to have a kind of pretending that we don't know the outcome. Holy Week is not a dramatic uh, representation of the last days of Christ's life. It's not as sometimes one can go to in various places, uh, passion plays, plays that, that act out the sufferings and death of Christ. The observance of Holy Week in the church is not a passion play. 
It, it does have dramatic elements, as of course all the liturgical services do, but its primary purpose is not drama or, or representation or any kind of imagining or pretend. We know that Christ is the risen Lord every day of, of our lives until, until we pass from this life. We know that even on Good Friday, that Jesus Christ is as much risen as he is on Easter Sunday. The point is that we must, with him, enter into the depths, the mystery, of his offering himself for the life of the world. And we begin with the triumph of Christ over death that begins with the resurrection of Lazarus, his friend. As we know in the 11th chapter of St. John's Gospel, we have the account of that ultimate miracle that Christ accomplishes before his passion. The last public uh, miracle before Christ enters into Jerusalem that's recorded in the Gospel of St. John. And Jesus purposely, uh, as, as the account in the Gospel tells us. He hears that his friend Lazarus is sick in Bethany, Lazarus, the brother of Martha and Mary, and he, he is far away from Bethany on the other side of the Jordan, and his sisters send a message to Jesus, Lazarus' sisters, that, that uh, the one whom he loves is sick, and Jesus says, this sickness is not unto death, but it is that the glory of God might be revealed. Yet he waits on purpose, and Lazarus, in fact, does die. And by the time Jesus goes uh, to Bethany, and he knows that by doing this, he's had to go across the other side of the Jordan, because already the, the plans have been laid by, by the chief priests, uh, and the elders of Israel that, that he must be done away with. And so he waits for his hour to come because he does not go to his death until the time comes that he sets because his death is not simply his falling into the hands of, of evil men. It is his voluntary embracing of death for our sake. So he knows that by going back to Jerusalem, and Bethany is only a little distance from Jerusalem, that he also is, is approaching his death. By the time he gets there, Lazarus has already been dead four days. And yet, uh, in fact, when he gives the, the uh, command to, to those standing around the grave to take the stone away, uh, Martha says uh, already he'll, be, he'll have begun to stink because he's been buried for four days. Uh, yet Jesus prays to his father and he, he cries out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth, and Lazarus rises from the dead. In this resurrection of Lazarus, as one of the hymns for, for the Lazarus Saturday says, uh, through Lazarus, Christ is already plundering you, O death. Christ is already robbing from you. And where, O oh Hades, is your victory? So in this raising of Lazarus, we see the anticipation of the confrontation between Christ personally uh, and death. Uh, Lazarus, Lazarus' resurrection is not yet a resurrection to eternal life. It is rather, he, Lazarus returns to, to human life and he will die again. But the... the Passing through death and the rising of Christ will be his, his Passover and making possible our Passover to the eternal life that death has no more power over. So, when one comes to church for the services on Lazarus Saturday, one experiences already the atmosphere of the celebration of the resurrection. After the 40 days of, of uh, the darkness of the Lenten services, we come to church on Lazarus Saturday, everything is bright, everything is joyful. Uh, it's a common practice on Lazarus Saturday to have the baptism of infants. And we sing as many as have been baptized into Christ. So even before we enter into the Holy Week, we have in the resurrection of Lazarus the foretaste of the victory of Christ over death. And this carries over into the next day. 
Palm Sunday, which is the day when, when Jesus enters Jerusalem, going freely to his passion. It is the beginning of the last days of his life in the flesh uh, on this earth. And it is the day when, for a very short period of time, he is declared to be a uh, king in an earthly sense. You see, the, the prophecies, the prophets of the Old Testament had foretold that the king, the Messiah, would come riding in humility, not riding uh, a stallion, a war horse, but riding humbly on a donkey. Uh, and would enter into Jerusalem. And Jesus does that on Palm Sunday. And he is greeted by uh, the crowds, those who believe in him as the King of Israel. They sing Hosanna to him, which means save us now. They, they acclaim him as the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The Gospel of Luke tell, tells us that they acclaim him as the King of Israel. So, for that very short time, uh, Jesus is acclaimed as king. Only a few days later, on Good Friday, he's going to stand before Pilate and say that his kingdom is not of this world. But on that day, Palm Sunday, the prophecies that the Messiah would come as king of Israel are fulfilled. The celebration in the church on that day does not simply look back to that historical entrance of the Lord into Jerusalem, but always when we uh, speak of Jerusalem in the church, we understand Jerusalem as, as having many levels. There is the historical Jerusalem, where Jesus entered uh, to suffer and die on the cross for us and to rise from the dead. There is also the spiritual Jerusalem, the Jerusalem of the heart of every Christian. So the, the welcoming of Christ as Messiah and King who goes to his death is also experienced on the level of the Jerusalem of the heart. And the ultimate Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem, Christ being acclaimed as King as, at his entry into the historical Jerusalem, anticipates his return in glory when he will be welcomed and acclaimed, received by those who love him and believe him as king forever, as king of the new heaven and the new earth. So, the observance of Palm Sunday is the celebration of triumph in honor of Christ the King. And on that day we read the prophecies from the Old Testament that are, that are fulfilled. Uh, I'll just refer to them briefly here, see if they're uh, written out here. Uh, maybe, uh, Palin, can you look in the stand and get me a Bible there? There should be one in, in fairly plain sight below. Thank you. At the services of uh, Palm Sunday, we read such pa such prophetic passages that come from the very beginning of uh, the history of Israel, from the book of Genesis, Jacob's prophecy of, uh, to his sons. And when Jacob speaks of, of his son Judah, he says, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor uh, the ruler from between his feet, until he comes for to whom it belongs the scepter of Judah, the scepter is the staff of the king, and to him shall be the obedience of the nations, binding his donkey to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. There are already the reference there to the colt that, that Christ rides into Jerusalem. He washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of the grape. And then we read from the prophet Zechariah the words that are that the Lord himself refers to when he enters into Jerusalem. And the Gospels tell us are ful fulfilled by the entrance of the Lord. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is righteous. He brings salvation lowly and riding on the donkey, a colt, the foal of the donkey. He shall speak peace to the nations. He shall rule from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. 
So, on Palm Sunday, in the liturgy for that day, we acclaim Christ as our King. We say that the kingdom that we belong to is His eternal rule that is beyond this world. And we bless palm branches in the church on that day, before the liturgy on Palm Sunday. We have the blessing of palms. We have a procession outside around the church with, with everyone carrying palms. And all of that is not so much a reenactment of the first Palm Sunday, but we, uh, like those uh, who are described in the book of Revelation, and the vision of John when he sees those who are triumphant over death who are these clothed, clothed in white carrying palm branches in their hands and the answer is given these are those who have come out of the great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb so these two days of, of celebration in the resurrection of Lazarus and in the triumphant entry of Christ as King into Jerusalem are the, the pre-feast, the anticipation of Pascha itself before we go into the darkness of Holy Week in which we must become participants in the death of Christ, encounter his death and his passage through death in his burial. We begin already with celebration of triumph. And then... Just as by the end of Palm Sunday, historically, this one day of triumph, the earthly triumph of Jesus Christ in this world, lasts for one day only. And by the end of that day, Jesus leaves Jerusalem and he will no more be welcomed. As, as king in Jerusalem. The next shout that will be brought against Jesus in Jerusalem will be crucify him on, on Good Friday. So when we come to church on the evening of Palm Sunday, we have a transition uh, from the glory of, of Christ coming as king to the beginning of the celebration of Christ going to his death. And so the church is once again darkened and the vestments are changed from bright uh, to dark. In fact, in, in our church, we follow the practice that's observed by many Orthodox throughout the world that during the days of Holy Week, these are the only days when we use black as a liturgical color. Uh, during Lent, we use a dark color, purple, but during Holy Week, we use black. And the black is the sign of the darkness that comes upon the world and comes upon those who reject Christ, that the price for the rejection of Christ by this world and the whole point of the observance of Holy Week is that those who reject him, whether it's Judas, whether it's uh, the leaders of Israel, whether it's the people who cry crucify him, whether it's Pilate or Herod, all of these do not act uh, privately. They do not act independently. No sin is committed in the world uh, independently from its effects upon the whole human race. So the rejection of Christ by those who do reject him is they reject him for in the name of the whole world. This world that can never become the kingdom of God. This world that, that can never be what we love. This world that, that is not capable of giving to us eternal life. So on Palm Sunday night in the church, we sing, here's an example of uh, what we sing. Passing from one divine feast to another from palms and branches. Let us now make haste, O faithful, to the solemn and saving celebration of Christ's passion. Let us see him undergo voluntary suffering for our sake, and let us sing to him with thankfulness a fitting hymn. And then there is another hymn that describes what our attitude should be in the presence of Christ going through his suffering. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, quoting the epistle to the Hebrews. For he is judge of the thoughts and meditations of the heart. Let no man draw near in order to make trial of his surpassing faithfulness. But let us come to Christ in meekness and in fear, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So, after these two days, then, the next part of Holy Week consists in the Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday 
uh, in which on those days, according to the history that is recorded in the Gospel, Jesus' last words to Israel take place. He tells uh, to his apostles what will happen before the destruction of Jerusalem and before the end of the world. He talks about the end. He tells the people the parables he, of watchfulness. He gives the parable of the talents. He talks about the ten virgins, uh, five of them that were foolish and that, that didn't bring enough oil in their lamps and five that did. So, and, and says over and over again that that we must be that those who who are who believe in God must be watchful. He talks about his rejection by Israel. He he gives the uh, he tells the story of of the wicked tenants that God sends his servants to collect the the harvest and they they don't give him the harvest. They instead uh, beat one and stone another and finally God says he will send his son. Uh, finally the the of course, the owner of the vineyard stands for God in the story, and he sends his son, and the son is cast out of the vineyard and killed, just as Jesus will be crucified outside the gates of Jerusalem. So he, and as his action, uh, we said the last, the last miracle of Christ before his entry into Jerusalem is uh, the resurrection of Lazarus, but. The miracle of Christ that takes place during these days is, is a fearful one. Jesus, when he comes to Jerusalem on the Monday of Holy Week, the day after his being uh, acclaimed as, as Messiah, enters the city and there's a fig tree there. And he goes to it and he's looking for fruit on the fig tree. And... Uh, the Gospel of Mark tells us that it wasn't even the right season for figs. And Jesus curses the fig tree. And he says, may no fruit ever uh, be born on you again. And the fig tree withers up. So this, this miracle of Jesus during these days is, uh, is a destructive one. Uh, and this fig tree, as, as all of uh, the fathers of the church that speak of this gospel passage, it is, it is a symbol, Jesus uses it uh, as a symbol of his rejection by his own people. That he comes to his own God, as the one sent by God, the only begotten Son of God, to receive the harvest of faith that everything that had been done for Israel since Abraham has now been fulfilled. And instead he, has, he is rejected. So this rejection by Israel is, is acted out. Uh, if you will, in, in, the, in this fig tree. And many of, much of what we sing in the church on the first day of Holy Week talk about the barren fig tree, how the fig tree was withered up because it didn't bear any fruit, and we should fear the same thing if we do not bear the fruits of repentance and love. The services on the first three days, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, follow the Lenten pattern. Uh, each morning in the church, there is the morning service, the service of Matins. And at this service are sung two hymns that are very beloved by the Orthodox. And they, they are called the hymns of the Bridegroom. One of them goes like this. Behold, the Bridegroom comes at midnight, and blessed is that servant whom he shall find watching. But woe to that servant whom he shall find heedless. Beware, my soul, do not be laid down with sleep, lest you be given over to death, and lest you be shut out of the kingdom. But rouse yourself, crying, Holy, Holy, Holy. So, the services of, of, of those first days try to... to kind of encapsulate the necessity of that vigilance. The, the, the services are lengthy on the first three days of Holy Week. And then later on, each morning on those days, we sing a hymn of repentance that again talk about Christ as the bridegroom and his kingdom as the bridal chamber. I see your bridal chamber adorned, O my Savior, and I have no wedding garment that I may enter. 
Enlighten the garments of my soul, O Savior, and save me. So we see ourselves as completely helpless when left to ourselves. That we have nothing of ourselves that will give us the, the wedding garment that enables us to enter into the kingdom of God. And we ask that through repentance it will be given to us, the enlightenment that comes from God. So, repentance and vigilance are the theme of, of the Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of Holy Week. And then, finally, on Wednesday, the rejection of Christ reaches its most specific and horrible point by, on Wednesday, it, that's, that is the day when Judas makes the agreement with the chief priests to betray Jesus. And from Wednesday on in, in Holy Week, it, it can be said, uh, I've, I've used this expression, I, I've not heard anybody else use it, but I think it, it fits. The memory of the church beginning on that day, in a sense, is, is haunted by Judas. By, by the memory of, of the betrayal by Judas of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. The church is, is terrified when she contemplates this, as, as you will see how much of what is sung in the church focuses on it. Because in the betrayal of, of Judas, we see the deadliness of evil that... The betrayal of Christ does not come from outside. It comes from inside, from within the ranks of the church, that one who is chosen by Christ to be one of his twelve apostles is the one who sells him to, to those who want to destroy him, and not even for some kind of grandiose price, but for what has been uh, figured out is the modern equivalent of about $22.50. It was not for a huge sum of money. That Judas, living in the presence of God incarnate, the Son of God made flesh, came to hate him. And because he hated him, he, he betrays him. And we see that, that, e that even when, when Mary Magdalene uh, lovingly anoints uh, Christ be, uh, on, on Palm Sunday, we hear that gospel uh, on Palm Sunday, that, that Judas says that, that, that it's a waste and, and from that time darkness enters into his heart. When we read in the gospel at the Last Supper that... Uh, Judas receives from the hand of Christ uh, a piece of bread. It's not the Holy Eucharist, but it's a token of love. And yet the Gospel tells us because already he, he had determined in his heart that, that he hated Christ that he, and, that he, and the agreement for the betrayal had been made. When he receives the bread from the hand of Christ, Satan enters into him. See, and that, and that, is, that is truly a, a very fearful and horrible thing. That he receives on the one hand something from the hand of Christ. Christ who gives only good, only blessing coming from him. Yet because he has alienated himself from Jesus, Satan enters into him at that time. So, the, the horror of, of the church at this is that this potential for evil, this is what the church realizes, exists in each one of us. In, there is in no sense are we, and this is, is something I think especially in our own time uh, to mention, because there is sometimes popularly, uh, in, especially in the last couple centuries, a kind of, of fatalism, and I'll, I'll explain in just a moment what I mean by that. In, in looking at the person of Judas, sometimes people say, well, it had been, it had been uh, foretold that, that uh, the Messiah would be betrayed, even for 30 pieces of silver. And so, therefore, uh, someone, someone was bound to have done that. So why, why should Judas be held as, as being worse than anyone else? But yet, uh, Jesus says of, of the one who will betray him, 
at the supper that the Son of Man goes as is foretold of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. And then the words that are the most horrible, the most fearful. Uh, and by, by horrible, I mean, in, in that most basic sense of the word, fearful, that ever came from the mouth of Jesus Christ, speaking of anyone, it would have been better for that man, he said, had he never been born. So it is, it is the reaction of the church. Every year we must contemplate that, that rejection by Judas of Christ and, and realize that, that part of it was because Judas was, was in love with this world. Uh, St. John tells us many times that, that he loved money. And it was through that love of money uh, it was not perhaps the only reason. He, was, he became, uh, perhaps, we don't know, uh, perhaps because Jesus was not the kind of Messiah that Judas uh, expected him to be, just as he was not for many in Israel. He was not a political Messiah. He was not a Messiah that was going to bring victory over Roman oppression. And perhaps Judas began to side with the enemy of, enemies of Jesus. And that, combined with his love of money, leads to his, leads to his rejecting Christ. But that does not cancel out that in Judas, just as there is in each one of us, uh, there is this potential for, for ultimate good and ultimate evil ultimate salvation and ultimate loss. Jesus did not choose Judas to be one of the twelve disciples with, with a kind of fatalism that, that somebody had to be chosen who was going to be a betrayer. Rather, it was because there was the potential in Judas for good. There must have been the potential for, in Judas for great good for him to be chosen to be one of the twelve. Yet he voluntarily and, and from his will turns against Christ. So that fearful warning, uh, that's how the first, the Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of Holy Week end with that, that warning that uh, unless we are single hearted, that's what the word in the Beatitude means. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the single hearted. Blessed are those whose love is fixed on God. For they shall see God. Unless we are single hearted, it is possible for us to become betrayers of Christ. It's also from, from Judas that, that we, we know that, that there is no such thing as uh, the guarantee of, of salvation. That membership in the church does not guarantee, does not assure that we will persevere to the end. Uh, there are some non-Orthodox Christians who teach that. Sometimes the phrase is used, once saved, always saved. That if you make the personal act of faith in accepting Jesus Christ as, as your personal Savior, there is a guarantee in that of salvation. And that is absolutely contrary to the doctrine of the church. That it is and, and it's a fearful thing, it is possible to fall away. Even, even if, like Judas, you live in the intimate companionship of Christ. So, so then at the end of, and as I said, uh, the services of those three days, on each Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, there's special uh, matins, morning service each day, and then in the evening, we have the liturgy of the pre-sanctified gifts, as we do, as we've had on the Wednesday and Friday, Wednesdays and Fridays of the preceding Lenten period. And at each one of those services, morning and evening, on each one of those days, there are readings from the Gospel, lengthy readings from from the gospel that cover all of the events of, of those days, ending with, the, with Judas agreeing uh, to betray Jesus. <coughs> then we reach Holy Thursday, the day on which took place the Last Supper, the institution of the Holy Eucharist, the washing of the disciples' feet at the Last Supper, the going, Christ going to his voluntary death, his agony and bloody sweat in the Garden of Gethsemane, and finally his actual arrest. So all of those, all of those events of the Passion are, are the focus of the liturgical services on Holy Thursday. The central service of that day takes place in the evening. It is the celebration of the Divine Liturgy. 
because it is on Holy Thursday, the day of the Last Supper, within the framework of that final meal in this world of Christ with his beloved ones, that he gives the ultimate gift of himself, the New Testament, the New Covenant in his blood, that even, as we've said a number of times, even before he goes to his passion, through giving himself uh, to his disciples at the supper by saying, this is my body which is broken, this is my blood which is shed, Christ, from the depths of his being, hands himself over over, voluntarily gives himself to his passion. And then uh, follow, and, and at the supper also as the sign of this new commandment, Jesus says to his disciples at the supper, a new commandment I give you that you love one another as I have loved you. That we are called the, the sign of our being uh, members of the body of Christ is not simply that we love, but that we love as Christ loves. And he says what that is. You love one another as I have loved you. Greater love than this no man has, that a man lay down his life for his friends. So, after the supper, Jesus goes to the Garden of Gethsemane and then enters into that agony in which he prays that the cup may be withdrawn from him, yet nevertheless, not his will, but the Father's will be done. He, his sweat becomes as great drops of blood falling down upon the ground. His disciples are sleeping. Uh, and then when Christ has finished his prayer, Judas comes with the soldiers and, and a crowd from, that are sent by the chief priests and, and Christ is arrested and his, and his actual passion then begins. So, in the services of Holy Thursday, as I said, we have the celebration of the liturgy with Vespers in the evening, an evening liturgy, uh, remembering the Last Supper in the evening when, when the Eucharist is given to us. At that, uh, at that liturgy, there is the, the, the celebrant of the liturgy, the priest, as Christ uh, did at the Last Supper, washes the feet of, of a number of members of the congregation. Of course, in, in a larger church, uh, it's, it's not possible for it to be done for all, but, but people are chosen every year for the washing of the feet. Then, following uh, that, that liturgy, there is generally a, a common meal. Uh, in many churches that are smaller and have the facilities that that meal is taken taken together in in uh, our church here, people return to their homes. But that meal is uh, generally uh, observed by Orthodox Christians as also uh, uh, a remembrance of the Last Supper. It's it's uh, a solemn meal. It's yet nevertheless, even though it still falls within the the rules of the of the fact. For Holy Week, uh, we, we try to make it a festive meal, and of course the other reason is it is the last meal that, that we eat and, uh, before entering into the total Paschal fast, the Paschal fast of, of uh, Good Friday and Holy Saturday, so it's meant to give us some strength for that too. And then, following, following that meal, uh, we return to church. It's, it's one of those nights uh, in, in the church where we have a vigil service. Just as uh, Christ, following the Last Supper, goes to the Garden of Gethsemane for his agony and arrest, and we, we return to the church to have a vigil. And at that vigil service, the vigil of Good Friday, the beginning of the services of Good Friday, we read the Gospels of the Passion. We begin by reading a very long passage from the Gospel of St. John of everything that, that Christ says to his apostles at the Last Supper. And then we continue on to read of, of the agony and, and betrayal and arrest of Christ, his trial before uh, the Jewish authorities before the high priest, uh, the, the denial of Peter, and then on into the rest of the Passion. The three ultimate days of the Paschal observance, Good Friday, 
in, in fact, that, that, uh, that expression, Good Friday, which is actually native to, to the Western Church, but, but Orthodox in, in English-speaking countries uh, do tend to use it. Actually, in our Orthodox service books, uh, the day is called Great and Holy Friday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, and the Paschal Sunday, Pascha, the days of the cross, the tomb, and the resurrection. In fact, they are often called the Pascha, the Passover of the cross, the Passover of the tomb, the Passover of the resurrection. These are, of course, the very center. It is, it is by what is accomplished for us on these three days that the salvation of the world is accomplished. The whole Holy Week is understood. It, it's great importance. That's why we call it also the Great Week, is those few days in the history of the world are understood to be the pivot, the pivot of time, the very center of, of time in the universe. Everything that, that took place for our salvation happened uh, in those few days, and that's why the experience of them is, is such, a, such a great and, and crucial thing in the life of the church. The first of the great three-day Pascha, uh, Great and Holy Friday, Good Friday, the day of the cross, the day of the, of the passion and death of Christ, is kept in the church as a day of almost continual worship. We have the uh, vigil service on Holy Thursday night with the reading of the Passion Gospels. Then, beginning early on Friday morning, we have the, service, the services of the great hours, the royal hours as they're called. Uh, these are, follow the same pattern that we have also on Christmas Eve and the Eve of the Theophany. The first hour, the third hour, the sixth hour, the ninth hour. Uh, six o'clock, nine o'clock, noon, and three o'clock in the afternoon, at which the services, at, at these services are sung all of the psalms that are, that the church has always understood to be fulfilled in the Passion of Christ, uh, especially the 21st Psalm that begins with the words of Christ from the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? They have pierced my hands and my feet. They look on and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. That King David wrote a thousand years before, before the death of Christ, yet, yet prophetically foretold the Passion so explicitly. And many other of the psalms as well are sung throughout uh, the services of, of the royal hours. And then there are also many readings from scripture, readings from the Old and New Testaments, particularly at each one of the royal hours, the full account of the sufferings of de and death of Christ is read at each one. Uh, Matthew at the first hour, Mark at the third, Luke at the sixth, John at the ninth. And in the middle of the church there is uh, a very large crucifix and that is the focus of attention for, for the entire day. The day is spent as a day of, of total fast uh, for all who have the strength to do it and even for those who cannot do that they try to come as, as close as physically possible to, to keeping the total fast. The it is, one, it is another uh, way that we experience the, the death of Christ, the fulfillment of those words that Christ said to the apostles. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them and then they will fast in those days. There is no celebration of the Eucharist on Holy, on Holy Friday, uh, not the divine liturgy or the liturgy of the pre-sanctified gifts. It's this absence of, of, of the presence of the Lord in the Eucharist. As we enter into his death, we experience his rejection by the world and, and also experience that the world itself died by rejecting the Savior. At, at the death of the Lord, not only the Lord dies, but the world dies in the sense that the world will never become paradise. This world will never become by itself the kingdom of God unless it dies also. So, 
The death of the Lord on the cross is really un- understood, experienced by, by the church as being the end of the world already. That, that from the death of the Lord on the cross, we live in the last days. We wait for, for we, just as in every celebration of the Eucharist, we proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes. So, on, on, from between the death of the Lord until his, He comes, we live in the last times. We live as those who are dead to the world. So, uh, Great and Holy Friday is the day of, of this most intense prayer and, and experience. The church tries to even physically participate through the, through the Paschal Fast in the death of the Lord, shutting down everything that, that uh, normally occurs in the worldly routine and, and spending all of one's energy on, on being focused through, through prayer and liturgical worship on, on, on the death of the Lord. Uh, I'll, I'll read uh, just a couple examples from, of, of the hymnography uh, for a whole, from Holy Friday. Every member of your holy body endured dishonor for our sake, your head the thorns, your face the spitting, your cheeks the blows, your mouth the taste of gall mixed with vinegar, your ears the blasphemies, your back the scourging, your hand the reed, your whole body extension on the cross, your limbs the nails, your side the spear. You have suffered for us and by your passion have set us free from sufferings. In loving outpouring you have stooped down to us and raised us up. O Almighty Savior, have mercy on us. And then perhaps the, the hymn uh, that, is, that is most well known uh, from Good Friday. Today he who hung the earth upon the waters is hung upon the cross. He who is king of the angels is arrayed in the crown of thorns. He who wraps the heaven in clouds is wrapped in the purple of mockery. He who set Adam free in the Jordan is slapped upon his face. The bridegroom of the church is transfixed with nails. The son of the virgin is pierced with a spear. We worship your passion, O Christ. Show us also your glorious resurrection. Never is it forgotten through all the services of Good Friday that the one who suffers and dies is God in the flesh. Otherwise, the death of Christ, the torment of Christ, however horrible it is, has no more, has no more significance than, than the death of many human beings. There are many uh, countless human beings who on simply the level of physical suffering, pain and death have suffered more than Christ from the human viewpoint, you see. That's, that's why it is who Christ is that, that is crucial. Uh, one, uh, one meditation on this that, that uh, is good for us, perhaps, so that we understand what we, what we do here is if, we, if there is placed before us a picture, an image of Christ crucified, and then a picture of, for example, all, all the, the children that were, that were thrown into Hitler's crematory oven, which one makes us more horrified? On the human level, see, it's the second. Uh, the, the sufferings of Christ, horrible as they were, uh, in time did not last all that long. You know, a few hours on one day. What, but what is central to them is that what is happening here is that God in his flesh, God has taken him to himself, human nature, in order so that he can die. And therefore, because God is limitless, the experience and depth of his sufferings is limitlessly beyond what human suffering could be. That's why even as Holy Week begins on on Lazarus Saturday, when we speak of, of Jesus weeping at the tomb of Lazarus, it's the shortest verse in the New Testament, two words, Jesus wept seeing uh, what has happened to his friend, that the one who is created to live forever is, is died and rotting in the grave. Yet, the hymns of the church tell us that unless the, the Son of God, unless one of the persons of the Holy Trinity had taken our flesh and become human, these tears would not be possible. Jesus becomes human 
Jesus becomes man in order to weep. Jesus becomes man, God becomes man, in order to die, in order to experience the emptiness and ultimate cursedness of death. So, even though the sufferings of Christ quantitatively in time don't, don't take very long time, yet in the depth of his, of his divine human being, they, they are the ultimate experience of suffering that has ever existed in the history of the world and that through the sufferings of voluntary suffering of God in the flesh out of love all of our sufferings all of our death are sanctified and given meaning they are no longer meaningless they are no longer uh, as as one of the uh, atheistic philosophers have said after a meaningless life a meaningless death uh, we, at, in this ultimate confrontation between life and death and the sufferings and death of Christ, uh, that's what, what the Lenten observance helps us to do, is, is to observe this or experience this in, in such an intense manner that we see that the, ultimate, the ultimate decision that is made. Either there is Christ and his saving death or there is emptiness and absurdity. There's nothing in between there. So, the services continue uh, on Good Friday to the afternoon. Uh, the hour of Christ's death on the cross, the ninth hour, is the most solemn of the royal hours. And because the Gospel tells us that at the death of Jesus on the cross, uh, it had become dark already. And that's why after the ninth hour on Good Friday, we, all, we begin immediately uh, the service of sunset, the Vesper service. And this, this evening service on Good Friday is the transition from the day of the Lord's death to the day of his burial. His death in order that he might enter into the state of death that which we've talked about before, that he might fulfill those words that God rested on the seventh day from all his work. And he truly does that in the flesh by entering into the state of death, that on the blessed Sabbath, the holy Saturday, Christ's body lies in the tomb, but his soul has entered into the state of death in which every human being that has ever lived uh, until the death of Christ encounters him. The bottomless pit of death in which it was impossible to know God. The dead cannot praise the Lord. Uh, the, the Psalms had said, the Old Testament says, nor any who go down into the silence. But now Christ goes to the very bottom of the condition of fallen man, lost in, in sin and death. He goes to the very depths of the pit. He enters into death. And by his burial, by his entry into death, death is transformed into life. And the dead that are waiting for him from the beginning of time encounter him. And finally their release from being shut out from the presence of God comes to an end. So, in the middle of the church... Uh, the, the center of the church's piety uh, for, for the services of Holy Saturday, at the end of Vespers on Good Friday afternoon, a large cloth icon, embroidered icon, that's called the Holy Shroud, uh, on which is embroidered the, the image of Christ uh, uh, in, in the state of death, uh, is placed in the middle of the church. And, and, and there's even an attempt, it's, it's, it, it looks like a tomb in the middle of the church. And all the services take place there. The, pe the people come frequently and make prostrations and venerate uh, the icon of, of the Lord in, in his death. And even while the liturgical services are not going on, people in the church uh, take turns praying there, chanting the psalms, so, so that ceaseless prayer goes on. I want to uh, read a few selections from uh, the services of Holy Saturday that speak of this, this uh, entry of the Lord into the state of death. When you, the Redeemer of all, were laid for the sake of all in a new tomb, death was br brought to scorn, and seeing you drew back in fear. 
The bars were broken, the gates were shattered, the tombs were opened, and the dead arose. Then Adam, in thanksgiving and rejoicing, cried to you, Glory to your humility, O lover of mankind. In the flesh you were of your own will enclosed within the tomb. Yet in your divine nature you remain uncontainable and limitless. You have shut up the treasury of Hades, O Christ, and emptied all its palaces. You have honored this Sabbath with your divine blessing, with your glory and your radiance. On Good Friday night, another liturgical vigil takes place. One of the... Uh, one of the most beloved services of the church, at which we sing the longest psalm, Psalm 118 or 119, that consists of 176 verses. Each one of them, each one of those verses talking about obedience in, in keeping the law of the Lord. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. And by praying that psalm, we understand that the only one who has kept the law of the Lord is Christ. He is the only one who has fully and completely, without any partaking in sinfulness, obeyed the law of, of the Father, even by voluntarily giving himself up to death. So he alone, his death was not... Uh, as our death, our death, as we've said, we don't have, we are, we are born sentenced to death. We are born with our death being inevitable. Even though we were born, we, ca we came into this world to live forever. Yet, we come into this world sentenced to death. In Christ's death, he did not have to die because he is sinless. He keeps the law of the Lord, yet he voluntarily gives himself up to death. And because, because of that unique death, the power of death over the human beings is broken. So, with each one of those verses of Psalm 118, there is a little verse of hymnography that's, that's sung. And it is the church's reflection on what happens by Christ's entry into death. O oh life, how can you die? How can you dwell in a tomb? By your death you have destroyed the kingdom of death and raised the dead from their graves. When devouring Hades engulfed the rock of life, this is one of the, of the I think, the, the most uh, uh, precise of these verses that describing what happens. When devouring Hades in, engulfed the rock of life, in great pain it burst asunder, and the dead held captive from all ages were released. We spoke before when we were talking about death, that, that by the entry of the Son of God in the flesh, in his voluntary sacrifice into death, uh, the fathers speak of death getting a great uh, stomach ache and vomiting out all the dead that it had held captive from the beginning. So the power of death over mankind is broken. So, we stand around the tomb of Christ on, on Good Friday night, keeping the vigil of Holy Saturday, contemplating his entry into death, contemplating that by his burial, death has been transformed into something that, is bottom, something that was bottomless and meaningless, into the path of life. This central day, the Holy Sabbath, on which Christ rests in the flesh, is the day of transition, the day of transformation between uh, the cross on, on Good Friday and the resurrection on, on uh, the day of Pascha, that we can't have a kind of uh, superficial understanding that, that the sufferings and death of Jesus are something sad that happens to him, but uh, uh, in, in, in one day the sadness will be replaced by joy. It's, it's much deeper than that. Death is not replaced by the resurrection. Death is the transformation into the resurrection. Death itself is turned into life. You have slept in the tomb, O Christ, a life-giving sleep, the hymns say. Uh, a few more examples. 
Today a tomb holds him who holds the creation in the hollow of his hand. A stone covers him who covered the heavens with glory. Life sleeps and Hades trembles. Adam is set free from his bonds. What is this sight that we behold? What is this present rest? The king of the ages, through his passion, has fulfilled the plan of salvation. And he keeps the Sabbath in the tomb, granting us a new Sabbath rest. Death becomes the means to rest. The rest that could never be obtained until God himself went to be in death. To him let us cry aloud, Arise, O Lord, judge the earth, for measureless is your great mercy, and you shall reign forever. Come, let us see our life lying in the tomb, that he may give life to those who lie dead in the tombs. Come, let us look today on the son of Judah as he sleeps, and with the prophet let us cry aloud to him, You have couched as a lion, who shall waken you, O king, but of your own will rise up. For you willingly have given yourself for us. Glory to you, O Lord. So, as we contemplate the burial of Christ, we realize that already, even before his resurrection, that's why even the icon of the resurrection in the church, as you've seen already, is Christ descending into Hades and pulling Adam and Eve, which stand for each one of us, out of their graves. It is this deliverance from death that Christ's entry into the state of death makes possible. And that is the mystery of the great and holy Saturday. On Holy Saturday, we continue this vigilance of the Paschal fast. As we said when we spoke about fasting, this is the, the central of the church's fast, this, this two-day, the most, the most arduous uh, of the church's fasts in which we, we are given a share of, of in, uh, an experience in by the combination of, of this ceaseless prayer and total fasting, of, of the experience of, of the death and burial of Christ, of waiting... Uh, it's been said that Holy Saturday, the day of waiting for the Sabbath to end and the resurrection to come, is the longest day of the year. That the, what we are to do on Holy Saturday, uh, because we've laid all earthly cares aside, is simply to wait. And that waiting on Holy Saturday uh, is an expression of what our whole life is. Our whole life is awaiting for our passage into the eternal life of the kingdom of God. Anybody who has experienced this in the church knows that this, this sense of anticipation, it's a kind of uh, condensation of one's whole life. And, and even beyond that, the Holy Saturday in the church, the waiting for the day of the kingdom of God, the day of the Lord, all of the history of the world, is, uh, you, one passes through that the whole the whole time as it has it, as it has been from the beginning until it, when it will end. Uh, we experience the waiting for for the end of all of that which is of this world on the Holy Saturday as we wait. So throughout the day on Holy Saturday, we we anticipate coming to church on Holy Saturday evening when. The Sabbath will pass and we enter into the celebration of the resurrection of the Lord, the Feast of Feasts. And that celebration in the church, first of all, consists of a vigil, Vespers and the liturgy of, of St. Basil on Holy Saturday evening. At that service, it's the tradition of the church that the new light for the whole year is blessed. The light that is the sign of God's presence with us. The light uh, that is the sign that the darkness of death did not overcome Christ the life. And that light is blessed uh, at the tomb of Christ in the middle of the church because it is from the tomb that new life comes forth. Then on Holy Saturday evening, we listen in the church to a series of, of readings from the Old Testament which are seen to be the types or the foreshadowings of the redemption that is accomplished through Christ. First we read from the very beginning of Genesis. We read the account of creation and how on the seventh day God rests and we see that fulfilled perfectly. 
in the burial of Christ. We read the account of the Exodus, the Passover lamb, the sacrifice of the Passover lamb for the deliverance of the people of Israel from Egypt, their passage through the Red Sea, and their deliverance from Pharaoh and their enemies pursuing them. And that is seen to foreshadow our passage Uh, from this world through death into life, that Christ delivers us not from the slavery of Egypt, but from the slavery of death and sin. And we hear the, the prophecy of Jonah, how Jonah's being in the belly of the sea monster for, for three days and three nights is an image of Christ being in the heart of the earth, as he said. And then finally we read the account from the prophecy of Daniel of the three young men who would not worship uh, Nebuchadnezzar's idol and were thrown into the fiery furnace, were delivered by the power of God from, from the fire. And that also is seen to be the most intense prophecy of the Old, of the Old Testament, of God intervening to, to redeem his people. Then, after the reading of the prophecies, if there is anyone to be baptized or chrismated on, on Holy Saturday night, that's when it happens. Of course, I've told you before that, that in the early church, uh, Pascha was the time that, that uh, baptism took place because we are baptized into the death and resurrection of Christ. It was only later in the church that, it, that, that baptism began to be uh, observed on other days in the year. So the celebration of baptism and chrismation at Pascha has always meant to be uh, central to, to the Paschal liturgy. Then... We have the first proclamation of the resurrection of Christ. And this, this is always something that uh, the Orthodox have great love for. It's, we, we take uh, the icon of the buried Lord from the middle of the church, from the tomb in the middle of the church, leaving it empty, and we place, we place it on the altar where, where the Holy Shroud remains for 40 days until Ascension Day. And then the priest changes all of his vestments from black to radiant white and everything in the church has changed from dark to light. And then the priest even takes uh, bay leaves and, and flower petals. And the bay, you know, that's the crown that, that uh, in the, now they're having the Olympic Games. The, the, in, in the ancient world, uh, the victors in the, in the athletic competitions were crowned with the laurel crown. See, the bay is, is the laurel. And takes the, the bay leaves and flower petals and, and goes around the church throwing them all over the place. And this, this is this. Uh, we do everything possible, you know, externally with the senses to, to show this victory over death. And, and the people are singing very beautifully the words, Arise, O God, judge the earth, for to you belong all the nations. And then after that, uh, the priest in his white vestments. Uh, and one has, to, one has to pass through all of the effort of Lent and the darkness and, and Holy Week uh, to, to, to know the joy that comes from. From uh, the priest goes to the middle of the church, standing in front of the empty tomb, and proclaims the gospel of the resurrection and and the joy of the new life that has been made possible through the death of Christ is on Holy Saturday evening, because it is uh, it is in that night that uh, between the blessed Sabbath, Holy Saturday, and and, and the, the resurrection, uh, the day of the resurrection, that that the Lord rises. When the gospel tells us that early in the morning, when the women came to the tomb, the Lord was already risen. So it is the whole Paschal night that is set aside in the Orthodox liturgy, not simply uh, 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 the sunrise later on, but the whole night. We have two uh, principal services. This first one that comes in the evening at the end uh, as, as the Holy Saturday, as the Sabbath is beginning to darken and the Paschal night comes. And then we have the service on Sunday morning which begins in the dark and ends in the light. So you see there's this very beautiful use of nature in the observance of the Paschal night. The first part of the vigil begins in the light and ends in the dark and the second begins in the dark and ends in the light. And at both of the services, of course, the Eucharist is celebrated on Holy Saturday evening, uh, which is, by the way, 
uh, sometimes sometimes people ask what is what is the uh, the climax of the whole liturgical year, the most important of the whole uh, of of all of the liturgical cycles. It is this vigil on Holy Saturday evening, in which everything that has come before is summarized in the Old Testament, and we have the proclamation of the resurrection, and then and then the first uh, Paschal celebration of the Eucharist, and then after that we we uh, have a light breaking of the fast. The church knows that after the effort to, uh, of, of the fast that's gone on for so many weeks and come to its culmination during the total Paschal fast, we need first to, to uh, break the fast lightly. So after, after the, the liturgy on Holy Saturday evening, there is usually a very simple meal of, of bread and fruit and wine that's taken. And then early in the morning, on Sunday morning, we come back to church to continue the celebration of the resurrection. We have the uh, giving of the Paschal light to everyone, and we have a procession around the church, again in darkness, proclamation of the resurrection gospel out, outside the church with the doors closed of the church. And then, uh, because the doors of the church are made to symbolize here our entry into the kingdom of God, and after the proclamation of the gospel of the resurrection, the priest knocks on the door of the church with the cross and the paschal greeting Christ is risen, indeed he is risen is shouted for the first time and we begin to sing what could be called uh, the orthodox hymn, if there is a hymn that, that the orthodox know best, it is the Easter hymn, the paschal hymn, Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death and upon those in the tombs bestowing life and we enter into the church which is all bright and radiant and we sing the, the glorious hymns of the paschal morning service, the paschal matins and have the uh, celebration of the liturgy and at which we, we partake again of the Holy Eucharist our, 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 just as the, in Israel the, the partaking of the Paschal Lamb was the center of the celebration of the Passover so we partake of Christ our true Paschal Lamb Christ our Passover Lamb is sacrificed and let us keep the feast in sincerity and truth St. Paul says so we feast on the body and blood of Christ and then after the liturgy on, on uh, Paschal morning we have uh, the blessing of all the foods that we have abstained from during the, during the Lenten fast and, and we, we enter into this uh, season of the church uh, which just as for all of those weeks of Lent we have experienced our life in this world as effort, struggle against evil, uh, exile uh, and, and finally culminating in this partaking in the death of Christ. So now we have the season of joy and celebration, the 50 days from, from Pascha to Pentecost, in which uh, there, is no, uh, there is no fasting, there is no kneeling. Uh, the whole season is meant to be a foretaste in this world of the new age to come, in, in which we, we, with joy and triumph, as those who share in the resurrection of Christ, who have already tasted the goodness of the Lord, uh, anticipate the joy that will be ours in the day that has no evening. O Christ, great and most holy Passover, we say. Wisdom, word, and power of God, grant that we may more par perfectly partake of you in the never-ending day of your kingdom, which will have no evening. So, this Paschal celebration, this immersion into the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord, is our way in time of tasting partaking, experiencing, first of all, of the means, the price by which eternal life and our redemption from death was made possible through the death and burial of God in the flesh, through his identification with our sin and cursedness and finally hand, handing himself over to death, and then, and then our share in his resurrection. Anyone who has kept the Orthodox Holy Week and Pascha uh, knows that, that by the grace of God, his generosity in the Paschal observance, we are given a foretaste of, of the joy that will be ours uh, when our prayer, come Lord Jesus, has finally been fulfilled and, and the kingdom that will know no evening is, is perfectly uh, present at the end of time. So, uh, we'll close there and, and we can have, uh, if there are some, some questions. Yes, Brian.
I had uh, two questions. The first question is, does Judas appear in iconography? Pardon me. Does, uh, does Judas appear in the iconography? In the iconography. Of the in the icons of, of the Last Supper... Uh, that that are put out on on Holy Thursday. Uh, Judas is shown there uh, at the Last Supper table. Uh, He's distinct from the other apostles because he's shown uh, without a halo and he's there uh, taking the the morsel from Christ. Also, there are icons of the betrayal of Christ in, in, in the garden where Judas is shown giving him the kiss. Yeah. I've even, uh, though... Though I, uh, I, there's, I've only seen one example of this. It was in a, it was in a church with very traditional iconography, uh, but I, I don't think there are many examples of this, and it's it's uh, pretty gruesome. But I, I've also seen uh, an image of, of Judas hung. Yeah, because of course that 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 is uh, the that is his end. The other question I had is uh, concerning uh, you, you address the once saved, always saved uh, concept. And how would you respond to uh, someone who believed very strongly in that? And in fact, an example that I am often presented with is the example of the sheep, the one sheep who strays away and how the, the shepherd goes back and leaves the 99 and right. goes and gets the other. That's what I'm often presented with. Right. And I, I was wondering if you could perhaps offer uh, an answer to that. First of all, we would have to uh, speak of, of how, we, how we understand salvation as Orthodox Christians, that, that it is a process that goes on all our life and, and is not perfectly fulfilled until uh, we, we share uh, the eternal life of God in the heavenly kingdom. It is not simply uh, receiving, receiving at one time the forgiveness of our sins because our struggle against evil is ongoing through life. That's why the Lord says in the gospel, he who perseveres to the end will be saved. And frequently... Uh, the New Testament speaks uh, because the epistles of St. Paul, for example, are they are not addressed primarily to the unbelievers. They are addressed to the church, to the believers. And they are full of warnings. Uh, what will happen to those who, having tasted the faith, having known the Son of God, uh, fall away and, and crucify Him afresh. Uh, and it's said that they will be lost. So, what we have to realize is that this, this perseverance to the end, God has made possible, God has done everything possible for us that, it, that, that, we, that we have that. If we are lost, it won't be through any lack on God's part. It will be because we, like Judas, God forbid, have, have chosen, have freely chosen, uh, using our, our will to reject Him. And if, because God respects our freedom, and, and that is, that's at the, at the heart of what we are as human beings, that we have free will, that God will never violate uh, our, our free will. If he were to do that, we would cease being human beings, created in his image and likeness. We would become something else. That if we use that free will to eventually hate God, there is nothing more that, that God can do for us. Because he continues to love us. Yet, if we, we will not accept his love and in fact hate him, and this can happen, the, the warning is given both in the Gospels, throughout the New Testament, and throughout the history of the church, that, that one can fall off the ladder. Uh, that doesn't mean that we do not have, uh, you know, the, the blessed hope, the blessed assurance. We do have that. We, we do have confidence and joy that if we, that if we remain steadfast and, and persevere, even, even though we are sinners, even though we fall, yet we are repentant and we continue to struggle, we do have confidence that, that in the end everything will be, will be perfected in us. But it's not, it's not a, uh, uh, confidence that takes it for granted ever. That, that's that's what I would uh, that's what I would say. There's much more that can be said too. 
Yes, uh, Kelly. Um, was Christ's betrayal by Judas uh, prophesied in the Old Testament? Yes. Yes, it was prophesied that that the Messiah would be would be betrayed. Even the Gospel quotes it. I'll read to you, uh, Saint Matthew. Judas, his betrayer, is from the the twenty seventh chapter. Seeing that Jesus had been condemned. And this is actually a very good translation here in this version, was remorseful. Sometimes uh, some English translations say that he repented. And it's very important because in the original Greek, the verb that's used is not to repent. To repent is to seek forgiveness. See, Judas was remorseful, but he did not seek forgiveness. Uh, he despaired. If he had, if he, even in his, that's the tragedy. Even after doing what he did, uh, which was which was worse on the other hand than 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 uh, what Peter did. Peter said he didn't he didn't know Christ. Peter denied Jesus uh, in in his weakness. Now that that perhaps you know if we're going to measure the gravity of sins, that's bad enough. It's not as bad as betraying him for thirty pieces of silver. But, but nevertheless, if Judas had repented, if he had if he had uh, even if he had had no no way to to go immediately back to Christ, who was uh, being crucified at at this time, if he had gone back to the apostles, he would have been saved. Judas would, have Judas would have been saved if he had repented. It would, no matter what anybody has done, if, if, if there is repentance, there is salvation. But he did not. He was remorseful and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders saying, I have sinned. See, he, that's clear. He, he, he knows. I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? You see to it. Then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. Despairing. Yeah, despairing. Uh, lo losing all hope in anything. Uh, he, did not, he did not throw... If he had thrown... If, if that was different. And that's why the free will is never, is never violated. Uh, if he had thrown the pieces of silver in the temple and went and repented, he would have been saved. But no, he despaired and hung himself. The chief priest took the silver pieces and said, It is not lawful to put them into the treasury because they are the price of blood. See, even, even the ones who, who condemn Jesus, they still want the law to be kept very carefully. That said that, that uh, blood money could not be put in the temple treasury. Uh, by the way, before I go on, another thing I, that I meant to say, and it's important to say because people ask questions about it all the time. In the Holy Week services, much is said about the faithlessness of the Jews. So that some people in these modern times, hearing the Orthodox services, accuse us of even of being anti-Semitic. Um, now, how all of these hymns, and rather than refer to them, you'll, you'll hear them when they come. There are plenty of them. They are all based on the Gospel. Uh, the Gospel of John describes those who reject Christ, who condemn and crucify Christ, uh, as the Jews. Uh, now John is himself a Jew. But what John is saying there is, is something uh, very important, something that the Christians can never, can never equivocate about. That what happens at the rejection and crucifixion of the Lord is that... <coughs> Uh, the Jewish people, as a people, stop being Israel. See, Israel means, in the scriptural sense, the chosen people of God. And from the crucifixion of Christ, there is a new Israel, and that is the church. And the church will consist of both Jews and Gentiles. But Israel for the Christians means the church. That's why, by the way, the Orthodox have no understanding that that uh, the state of Israel as it exists is some sort of fulfillment of biblical prophecy and the, and the reestablishment of the kingdom of God on earth or something as some, as some non-orthodox would, would think. 
that the only chosen people in, in the full, fullest sense that, that there are now in the world are those, who, are those who are Israel, and Israel is the church of Jesus Christ. So a tragedy occurs in Israel, and St. John uses the expression, the Jews, not to mean everyone who is ethnically Jewish, but to mean those who reject Christ. And that's the sense that the church uses it. Uh, so it's important for us to understand. Uh, but, but these... Uh, the, the accusations of, of anti-Semitism you know, uh, are, are wrong, yet uh, what's happened even in, for example, the liturgical texts, traditional uh, liturgical texts of the Roman Catholic Church that come from the early days of the church, when, when all the church was one, uh, they, they've changed them uh, in response to pressure from, from Jewish groups. Uh, and, and, and that we would say we cannot do any more than we can change the gospel. That, that a tra just as a tragedy occurs on the level of Judas, a tragedy occurs on the level of, of uh, the old Israel also in the death of Christ. And it is part of the blackness of Holy Week. And, and it, it, it's not going to go away. It's there. We must face it. Go on now, because to answer your question. <laughs> so the chief priests who uh, took counsel and bought with the, th the 30 pieces of silver the potter's field to bury strangers in. Therefore that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, They took the 30 pieces of silver, the value of him who was priced, whom, those of the ch whom they of the children of Israel priced, and gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord directed me. So there is a prophecy. Now, th here's another. This is a, a little rabbit trail. Uh, but... This is one of the examples that show that though the scriptures, uh, of course, are inspired, yet nevertheless they are, they are written by, by human beings who can have human failures. Because the quotation that, that is here, even though it says from Jeremiah the prophet, is in fact from Zechariah the prophet. So Matthew made a little mistake there on the human level. And we don't fix it, you know, to say, well, this is really Zech <laughs> Zechariah, we leave what, Je what, he, what he wrote. But it's, it's an example. See, uh, so there is there there is uh, this quotation from the prophet Zechariah that the Messiah, the promised Messiah, is going to be betrayed for thirty pieces of silver, and that that, that price is going to be taken and used for this. So, so if it hadn't been Judas, it would have been somebody. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's the, the whole point of prophecy is that. Even though God, uh, in, in the prophecies of the Old Testament, we, we get a little, a little glimmer of, of the complete and total perfect knowledge of God, that God knows everything. But that does not mean that God is the cause of us, uh, of evil. God is not the cause of the abuse of our free will. And Jesus knew, uh, knew along the way what was going to happen with, with Judas. Even halfway through the Gospel of John, uh, he says, have I, have I not chosen you twelve and one of you is the devil? Well, he did not choose uh, the one who was a devil because he needed one. See, he, he chose the twelve because every one of the twelve because they had they had the potential as each one of us do for both good and evil, and one of them chose. That's the whole point of the of the tragedy there of Judas. That it is Judas' choice. So. Dick, Father David, one of the one of the real uh, evident differences that one experiences coming from Protestantism is the, the way the Orthodox deal with death. And there's just two or three phrases that I'd like you to maybe tie together. The trampling down death by death, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Someone touching the dead was considered to be unclean for a period mm -hmm. of time. And then the whole death as it relates to Pascha. Right. There seems to be a, a fairly major difference between a reformed or Protestant yes. view of death as, as something to slip through because the goodies were going to come on the other side mm -hmm. as opposed to the Orthodox view. Can you address that? Yes. The, the expression so central that Christ has trampled down death by death, that, that expresses that not from, uh, not from an act outside of our human condition, 
Not by an almighty, an act of almighty power uh, somehow reversing uh, our, our problem. And, and the human problem is death, more ultimately even than sin. Because we've talked about that before. Death is the cause of sin. Death, is, death takes place because of sin and, and death perpetuates sin. And it's through the fear of death that we're held in lifelong bondage. Not, God does not destroy that from outside. He destroys it from within. He gets in it himself. Uh, we, could, we could use uh, such an expression. Uh, uh, he, does not, he does not save us without getting his hands dirty. Uh, and, he, and he takes human hands so he can get them dirty. He assumes, he assumes our, our humanity so that he precisely can die in the flesh. And, who is, and we have to be uh, clear what we mean by that. It's not, it's not simply Christ's human body that dies. It's not, remember, you cannot cut Jesus Christ up into two, two pieces. The, the divine piece and the human piece. Everything that happens with Jesus Christ happens to the eternal Son of God. That's why on the cross, God dies in the flesh. Now, here we are speaking of the person of the Son. We are not speaking of the Father. We are not speaking of the Holy Spirit. But we are speaking, nevertheless, of the person of the Son, who is everything that the Father is, except he's the Son and the Father is the Father. And he assumes humanity to die. So, God dies. That's, that's the whole... The whole experience of Holy Week and Pascha is focused on that. That it is God who dies. It is God who, buried, who is buried. It is God who rises. And, and the whole reason why he's become a human being is that so he can do it. He, he can do it in the flesh for us. He can do it by taking the created flesh to himself that he's made us in and that he is determined to save. So, therefore, it is this saving death of Christ that... That's what we mean by death is trampled down. The power of death over mankind is trampled down by death, through the means of death, by God dying in the flesh. And God's dying in the flesh, that's what transforms death. That's what takes the sting out of death. It does not abolish death, because we all still have to die. But our death is different from those who die uh, it's different from those who died before Christ. It, our death is different from those who die uh, not, not wanting Christ, not believing in Him. Whether, they, don't, whether uh, they will have, if they have not believed in Him in this life, they'll have, they'll have the opportunity to encounter Him at death, and then the ultimate choice will be made. But in, in either sense, death becomes the path to life. In death, we find life. In the cross is our salvation. See, that's the resurrection does not abolish the crucifixion in the Orthodox experience. The crucifixion and the resurrection remain inseparably united. The risen Lord is the Lord who offers himself to death and is crucified. That's why, and that, that is nothing else but apostolic Christianity. That's why St. Paul, we would, uh, we would perhaps say, expect St. Paul to say, I preach nothing but Jesus Christ and him risen. He doesn't say that. He says, I preach nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified. I, I guess the area of question that I have and maybe this is not in your purview to answer, uh, I would think most of the Protestant evangelical theologians that I'm familiar with would agree with you right down to the Nat's eyebrow on everything that you have said. Yet the result in their view of death is, uh, if not 180 degrees from the Orthodox view of death, I don't know what is. They don't, they don't see, or my understanding of them is that they don't see the Pascha aspect of death? I think it is because there is a lack in, in realizing what the consequences of the Incarnation are. What the consequences of, of God, the Son of God, uniting Himself to, to the material creation, to the mortal body are. That it, that it, it, 
accomplishes the transformation of our mortality into immortal life. That, that our, our flesh and blood is not, is not destroyed. It is transformed. Flesh and blood of itself cannot inherit the kingdom of God, but it has to be transformed according to the image of the crucified and risen Lord. So, <coughs> therefore, death becomes holy. The, in the old covenant, the dead bodies, uh, the dead bodies were, you could, if you had to have contact with them, it, it made you ritually unclean. But now, through the death of Christ, Christ... Christ has united himself with death. Death is not the same anymore. So, therefore, even in the Orthodox burial, which we haven't spoken of, uh, this is a good time to mention it for a minute, the Orthodox burial is modeled on, on the Paschal celebration. Just as we have on Holy Saturday the, the icon of the body of the Lord in the middle of the church, when, when an Orthodox Christian dies, his body lays in the middle of the church. It's not, it's not something, some, some shell for the soul that's been cast aside. Rather, it's the sanctified temple of the Holy Spirit for which Christ assumed flesh and died. So, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints from the, from the uh, psalm. That's, and, and it's, it's uh, very, very crucial that, that even in the Old Testament, it's one of these uh, prophecies of, of the transformation of death. That the death of those who are in Christ is the life-giving death of Christ. His death is our death. That's the whole point of saying that we have died with him in baptism. That our whole life in this world and, and its culmination in physical death is our share in his death. It's not our isolated death anymore. His death is our death. His resurrection is our resurrection. Does that? And then that ties into the, the possibility of deification yes. for the believer. Yes. So, and so, and so the, the deified, transfigured body of Christ is seen and, and known as what the scripture says it is, the first fruits. And if there are first fruits, there's going to be later fruits. And the later fruits are us. As, as he is, so we will be. And, and the church tells us, uh, so we are already, even though, even though without seeing we have to believe. Anymore? Yes. Um, so I took a class before you talked about when a Christian dies, they are um, going to a state that's kind of active sleep, where your soul is still being transformed into the image of Christ. Yeah. Um, at that point, I was unclear about whether um, a person who maybe did not accept Christ on the earth still possibly would have a chance to do that in this active sleep state. Is that correct or not? If what, what we say regarding this life is that what is ultimate in this life is that we have lived either in acceptance or rejection of Christ. Now, we cannot judge whether or not someone has, has accepted or rejected Christ. It will be revealed uh, that, that those who, who have claimed, and, and he tells us so in the Gospel, those who have claimed to have accepted him really have not. There will even be those who have said, uh, Lord, Lord, did we not preach and teach in your name? Should be, everybody who preaches and teaches should be very fearful. Did we not heal the sick in your name? Did we not cast out devils in your name? Say, I never knew you. Obviously, what they were doing, uh, there was something wrong at the root with what they, what they were doing. So, and on the other hand, there may be those who, who cannot have been said to have believed in Christ for various reasons in, in this world. Uh, I'm thinking primarily of those who, who uh, are part of other religions. Who yet nevertheless, when they encounter him at death, will, will see in him the, fu the fulfillment of, of the good life that they tried to live according to what they had. Now, but, that, but it does not mean that for those, and, and the, the church clearly teaches that there are those who in this life fully 
ultimately embrace evil and reject God. To do that in this life is irreversible. The, the, the life after death is not a second chance in that sense. Rather, for those who, who belong to Christ, who, who believe in Him, who love Him, uh, they, we will experience after death because, because uh, life is dynamic, it's not static, we're never frozen, uh, we're not some sort of, we're not dormant or in some sort of state of suspended animation when we die. Rather, we sleep in Christ. We sleep Christ's sleep. Uh, and, and Christ's sleep in death is a very active one in, in which we partake in, in what his, his burial and resurrection has made possible. And that includes the, the continual and ultimate purification until the end of time of ourselves from every effect of sin and evil. But it does not mean, it, it cannot mean the reversal of an ultimate rejection of God in this life. Is that, does that help clear? I think one statement that you said in one of your classes is that um, we should pray for Judas because we don't know where he's at. And I think that... I don't think I'd put it quite confused. that way. Okay. That's, uh, I, I, have, I have said, as we can read, I think I even read a passage from the fathers from St. Isaac of Syria, right here, for example, and there are others, who used to, uh, in, their, in their great love for, for uh, everyone and everything, as we say, for everyone and everything in the church, would weep even for the demons. They had, they had uh, no hatred, the saints, for anyone, in, including, including the most evil of men, uh, and, and we are not, you know, we, we are not called to hate Judas, and we are not called to hate Hitler and Stalin. We don't get anywhere from that. The, the only, only the devil hates. We are called to hate evil. But we, we, hate, we hate no person created in the image and likeness of God, as God does not. And, there, and, there, and by the way, uh, that's why, uh, even though... With everything that the church sings regarding Judas, uh, the, the horror of it all, and, and the words of the Lord in the gospel, better had, for that man had he never been born. Yet, uh, the one thing that we don't sing about uh, in, in the church uh, is his eternal damnation. Because it's not given to us to sing about the eternal damnation of anybody. It's not part of what's been revealed to us. So we are, and even as we sing those things, uh, we, we are, you know, we're, we're not to sing them. That's how people misunderstand the Orthodox hymnography, especially directed, that's directed uh, toward, uh, toward or against Judas or the Jews, thinking uh, somehow that we're singing it vindictively or vengefully. The whole thing is, is that we sing it sorrowfully. So, uh, in, in, in that sense, we are called to have compassion for everyone. And that would include Judas, yes. We, there's, uh, it's not to say that, that we, would, you know, we would have prayers in the church for, for uh, the, the demons or, or for Judas. We can't do that. Uh, because it's impossible for us to speak for them. But we, we are called to have compassion for everyone and everything. Though, uh, I, I, I might have used this illustration. And this is, you know, in, in, the, in the history of the church, people have done sometimes some pretty unusual and, and things. And here's an example of one. Uh, and I just give it to you for, for what it is. One of the... Uh, but pretty well known. I, I recommend his books, actually, though he's not. He's a uh, Roman Catholic uh, uh, French writer, George Bernanos. Uh, maybe some of you have heard of him. He wrote such books as Diary of a Country Priest and, and uh, uh, Under the Sun, S-U-N, of, of Satan. Uh, books about my teacher, Father Alexander, used to say that if you want to read fiction that, that uh, expresses the power of evil, read Bernanos. Uh, when Berenos was a little boy in, in France, he uh, was pre uh, sometimes 
preoccupied, we could say, with a feeling of great, uh, not only horror, but, but compassion for Judas. And precisely because it was, he, he could never, he could never get over his, his, uh, his sadness that, that someone, that someone so close to Christ had, had uh, done what Judas had done. So, uh, you know how, how people in the church, they will occasionally ask during the services for, for prayers for certain people, like we do all the time. Well, of course, uh, he did not dare to tell the priest specifically what was on his mind. But he would, he would at regular intervals ask the priest to remember in the services a soul in torment. I, I, find that, I find that very beautiful and moving thing. I, I, I'm not, I would not try to make any kind of conclusions from it. You can, we can't. But it's an example of something. So, uh, without, without knowing the name and, uh, of, of whom he was praying for, uh, a priest uh, offered prayers uh, at the altar in, in a little village in France for the one of whom Jesus Christ said it would be better for him had he never been born. And I don't, I don't, I don't attempt to say any more about it. No. Yes. <clears throat> Okay. God is with us through his grace and love for mankind always now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen.